President Donald Trump has surprised the Pentagon and even his allies in Washington, as well as the international community, with his abrupt decision to give Turkey the green light to launch a cross-border military operation against the Syrian Democratic Forces. That's the Kurdish-dominated group that American troops have armed, trained and fought alongside in the battle with ISIS. With me to discuss the possible outcomes is Andrew England, the Financial Times Middle East editor. Andrew, first of all, tell us why is this important? Why should anyone care about what's going on with a small group in Syria? Yeah, it's a small group, but it's a very important group. They, for several years now, they've been at the forefront of the US's battle against ISIS in northeastern Syria, which is an area controlled by the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces. Now, these guys have been on the ground. They've been very successful in reclaiming territory from ISIS. They've captured thousands of ISIS fighters, about a thousand foreign fighters. They are detaining those fighters, plus their families, wives and children, and this kind of thing. So the main concern for Europeans looking at this is what happens to the battle against ISIS. If this and what happens to all these fighters? Because many European countries don't want to actually take them back. Absolutely. And the concern is if Turkey does uh, launch an operation into northeastern Syria against the Kurds, then they'll be distracted. The detention of uh, all these Syrian uh, all these ISIS fighters would be in jeopardy. What happens to them? What happens to the battle against ISIS? Does ISIS re-emerge? So that's one element. Why, why is Turkey so determined to move into Syria. The Syrian war is practically over now. So why start a new front? You're right. Turkey has, for years, had concerns about what they believe to be Kurdish separatists. Uh, the PKK, a Turkish group, has been fighting the Turkish state for more than 30 years. And Turkey sees the Syrian Kurds as an extension of the PKK. So in Turkey's eyes, you know, the US has been arming, training uh, terrorists Turkey calls terrorists on their border. So this has for a long time been a point of contention between the US and uh, Turkey, Ankara. And what do we think happened uh, two nights ago? I know that for a while Donald Trump has wanted to um, bring back, bring the troops back home. And he tried um, earlier this year, at the end of, of last year, and his Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis, at the time, resigned. Uh, so he went back on, on his decision, at least partly. So what happened now? Good question. But it's Donald Trump, so we're not really sure. What we do know is that uh, Mr. Trump had a telephone conversation with President Erdogan of Turkey uh, on Sunday, and then on Sunday night, in the early hours, uh, the White House put out a statement saying uh, Turkey would launch operations in the northeast Syria soon, and US troops who've been supporting the Kurdish militants but also been doing joint patrols with the Turks along that border uh, as, as confidence-building measures would withdraw. So basically, he was seen to be giving, like you said, a green light. But he's and essentially uh, upended his own government's policy towards Syria and towards Turkey. Yes, but it wouldn't be the first time. And to be fair, I mean, Donald Trump has long said that his you know, he wants to take, bring the troops home. As you said, in December last year, he announced that he was going to take an estimated 2,000 uh, American troops out of northeastern Syria. There's about 1,000 left. So he's always made that a campaign issue. And he's always been very clear. He doesn't really care about what happens in Syria. For him, he said the priority is the fight against ISIS. He claims, you know, that the ISIS caliphate, self-declared caliphate, is defeated because ISIS has lost his territory. So he kind of wants to wash his hands of this now. He says, look, the Kurds, we paid them, they got made lots of money, this is not our war. He said, you know, we were supposed to be there for um, a short period and we've been there all this time, let's get home. Um, I, see, I see the logic in that, but what is the problem? Who actually gains from this? And is there any chance of um, not only ISIS coming back, but other, other elements, other parts of the Syrian war um, erupting again. I, th I think <laughs> the last thing Syria needs is a new front and any more instability. That northeastern region has pretty much stayed out of the civil war that's been going on since 2011 in Syria, and the Kurds haven't fought against Assad. But what this does, it sends a message to, or well, this is the fear, it sends a message to you know, any US allies who've been, local allies who've been fighting on the ground, we don't care about you, you're expendable, we can dump you. 
end that will be seen as a symbolic victory, at least, to Iran and Russia, which have sided with President Bashar al-Assad, the Syrian president, during the civil war, because it will be seen as another sign of the US withdrawing from the Middle East, uh, symbolically uh, sort of ha just saying we, we no longer care about what happens in the Middle East, which would be seen to embolden Iran and Russia, which have taken advantage of European and US marginalization in Syria to, to, to extend their own influence. Has uh, Donald Trump uh, received any support from anyone? Uh, President Erdogan. <laughs> no, uh, to be fair, we, no. I mean, Republicans in the US spoke yes, very strongly against Yes, I saw that Lindsey this. Graham said that the decision wa was short-sighted and irresponsible. Exactly, a disaster in the making. Democrats have, have spoken out against. European governments have put out statements saying that they're concerned about what happens in the fight against ISIS, anything that brings more stability. Aid agencies have raised concerns about another flood of displaced people. It's really, hundreds of it's really of interesting, in uh, Andrew, no, that we... the, the concern is not about the Kurds. And yet the history of the Kurds has been one where they are repeatedly let down by Western allies that they work with. What happens to the Kurds in this case? This was, all, well, this was always going to be a huge question anyway, because you know, the Kurds, the SDF, they've used the battle against ISIS and the civil war to sort of carve out this kind of autonomous enclave in the northeast. Now, the Assad regime has been fighting, Assad regime has been fighting rebels and opposition across the country, so they've kind of stayed clear of this and they've allowed the SDF to sort of maintain their autonomy, fight against ISIS and have their alliance with the US. At some stage, this was always going to become a question of what happens next. Now, the SDF has had talks with the Assad regime uh, previously, as the war in Syria has diminished, uh, and they have to try and work out what kind of arrangement there will be. This could actually push the SDF closer to the Assad regime and whether they can negotiate some form of autonomous, decentralised rule or not. But we, we don't know. I mean, that's going to be a big question that's got to be resolved. And it was always going to be a, uh, a sticking point as the Assad regime reasserts control over most of the rest of the country. Once they've done that, then the question of what happens in this northeastern area is, on the Turkish Is border. there an argument that Donald Trump is ultimately right in his analysis of of the situation because what else would um the kurds do and where else would they go if they're squeezed between turkey which doesn't want them to have any autonomy and the regime in damascus which also doesn't want them to have autonomy so unless the us protects them for the much longer term they're going to have to make that choice and to re-engage with the assad regime look i think the kurdish issue in, in the northeast was is always going to have to be resolved there's got to be a solution to it at some point or there will be conflict and Trump is correct in saying that the battle or this conflict, the simmering conflict between uh, Ankara and um, Kurdish separatists has been going on for decades. The question is how you manage it. What had happened after um, Trump was persuaded not to withdraw all his troops uh, after saying he would in December last year, uh, we've seen sort of some confidence building measures. So US troops since uh, August have been doing joint patrols with the Turks on the border and they've been doing joint um, air patrols and moving the SDF was removing some of its um, defences close to the border. The problem was Erdogan wasn't satisfied. He wanted to go deeper into Syria. He wanted to create a, he wants to create a uh, a safe zone 32 kil kilometres deep inside Syria. The Americans weren't going to go that deep. So now it seems like he's convinced Trump that this is the way to resolve this is to allow him to move uh, Turkish troops in and create this zone. And then Erdogan argues that that will allow for the resettlement of some of the 3.6 million refugees that Turkey is hosting. And that's a huge domestic assuming, pressure on Erdogan. Uh, assuming but, that, they, that the refugees want to go back to assuming Northern Assuming they Syria. do and assuming it's not forced, and, you know, would that shake up the whole demographics of this region? If they, you, you're sending Arab Syrians into, back into this area who didn't come from this area. But still, you're going to have to resolve the Kurdish question. And so the question is, should the US be there to play a leading role in confidence-building measures between the Kurdish militants and Turkey whilst the resolution is resolved? And should there be greater political pressure 
on actually getting the um, settlement or some sort of political transition in Syria that everybody seems to have forgotten about. Well, yeah, we've been waiting for a very long time for a political transition um, in Syria. So my last question to you, Andrew, is uh, given the backlash in, in D.C. and indeed uh, across the world, do you think this time uh, Trump, President Trump will stick with the decision or do you think by tomorrow he would have said, OK, I've, you know, now I understand better and um, I will not pull all the troops. I think that's what we need to wait and see what happens. Um, after there was a backlash, you know, Trump tweeted that he was, you know, economically destroy Turkey if they did things that were against certain limits. We don't know what that means. Was it a response for the backlash? Is it just bluster? Or would he put pressure on Turkey not to go far? Because the other question we, you know, we have to ask is, you know, what will Erdogan do next? You know, he's been made for, for months, you know, talking about the need to create this zones deep inside Syria and you know, constantly belligerent rhetoric against the uh, Kurdish militants, how will he act now? You know, now he's got the green light, the onus is on what, what does he do? Now, will he go deep into Syria and potentially create that, that conflict with the um, Syrian Kurds? Or will they just go in so far to, you know, where they uh, don't go deep enough to actually trigger a bigger conflict. So there are many variables I think we're going to have to watch. But clearly, you know, I mean, Jim Mattis, who you know stood up to Trump last time and then resigned, he's gone. You know, there are less adults in the room, as we say, you know, in the White House, in the administration, to put pressure on Trump. But clearly there is a Republican backlash which might make him think twice. So a story that we will keep on watching very closely with our correspondents on the ground and with you here in London. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Ruth.